be responsible for, but John couldn't make it, so here we are. Let's give him a hand. <clears throat> um, hey, everybody. Thanks for coming to our SciPy 2023 talk, New CUDA Toolkit Packages for Conda. I'm Thompson Comer, here with my colleague Rick. We are both uh, Austin NVIDIA office members. And we're giving this talk essentially on behalf of John Kirkham, who you see is the third author on the talk. He did the bulk of the work in actually developing new Conda packages for the CUDA toolkit and even making the first round of slides. And so Rick and I came in, helped get the slides revised into their final form, and then we're presenting. John is here in AirMeet. You can talk to him in Slack if you need to, if you have any questions that Rick and I can't handle. Uh, and he'll be representing us also like uh, on GitHub where a lot of these CUDA toolkit packages have their lifespan. So a quick agenda on this presentation. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what CUDA is and what the CUDA toolkit is. Uh, many of you probably already know, but some of you may not. And for those of us who are working at NVIDIA, it's of highest importance to us to get CUDA on your radar. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Uh, the next subject is what Conda is and what the channels that are available in Conda provide you as a user of Conda and as a developer who wants to put your packages into Conda and how to take advantage of them. Uh, and then we've got two generations of CUDA toolkits available on Conda that we're going to talk through today, which is essentially the purpose of this presentation. Uh, the first generation, we began in 2018. Uh, we got everything available and running on Conda, and then based on user feedback, uh, John, over the last year or maybe even a little longer, has been working on the next iteration of the CUDA toolkit that's going to be more powerful and more flexible and easier for you to use as a CUDA developer who also uses Conda like many SciPy uh, programming authors are. Uh, so at that point, Rick is going to take over and go into the details of a lot of the new design decisions that we made and John made in the new CUDA toolkit packaging, how to use it how to use it in your own build, how to take advantage of it as a user. And then we'll talk about how we're going to um, recycle feedback from you like we did in the last generation and uh, where to go from there. OK, so the first part of the talk is, what is CUDA? Compute Unified Device Architecture is what it stands for. Uh, but what does that mean? So back in 2007, approximately, uh, NVIDIA released the first version of the CUDA toolkit standard. And what CUDA is, is it's a whole suite of application tools that allow you to take advantage of a new programming language called CUDA that is essentially a superset of C and C++. It allows you to write C++ code with special markers, new markers here and there for code that's going to execute on your host, like normal C++ code and then uh, a new set of tokens that identify code that's going to execute on your GPU that is going to take advantage of the um, extremely high degree of parallelization that's available, especially on the latest GPUs that you can buy from NVIDIA. Um, the CUDA toolkit is a pretty big expanse of software tools that make developing CUDA easier to do, um, you know, with the basis being, you know, how do you get the first software samples, the example libraries for implementing code that runs on the GPU. Uh, but then it's also got the compiler, of course. It's got the debugger tools that allow you to break execution of GPU code and step through while it's executing on the GPU, which is an exceptionally important tool and not something that you can do using only host-based tools. If you try to break and debug uh, an application that you've written to run on the GPU using GDB in C++, you will never be able to reflect on what's happening in the GPU, which could be the bulk of the processing that you're doing. Uh, finally, there's other important tools like profiling tools like Insight that demonstrate to you when you're executing code on the GPU, uh, how good your GPU utilization is for the code that you've written because there's, there's uh, well parallelized code and there's badly parallelized code. And you can write code that only takes advantage of 5% of your GPU's overall computing capability or you can write code that takes 100% advantage of your GPU's parallelization. So the Insight tools help you understand how well your, your code is utilizing the GPU that you paid for. Uh, and then finally, there's actually the libraries that the suite of GPU-driven code that is written take advantage of. Uh, maybe the best example of that is Kublas in this slide. 
right? That's the basic linear algebra subroutines that run on the GPU. So we've all been using BLAST as scientific programmers for, what, 30 years now, Fortran and C. Uh, you don't want to rewrite every matrix solver on your own. Well, the nice people at NVIDIA have written GPU accelerated matrix solvers that perfectly match the BLAST API, but typically are many, many times faster than the host executed version of BLAST. So these are the things that you need to get when you install CUDA Toolkit, and what we're trying to do, making it available in Conda, is to make your life as a GPU, Python, SciPy developer much easier. So pretty much everybody at SciPy knows a little bit about Conda. Uh, it's a package manager, uh, just like the environment tools that you would use in Linux when you say apt-get. Uh, it's even more significantly like pip. Everybody who's a Python programmer at this stage uses pip to install the libraries that they depend upon. Conda's a little more flexible than pip, a little more powerful than pip, and it's why NVIDIA has focused, and we're, we're moving in the direction of pip, and we're releasing a variety of new libraries on pip every day, uh, but we began with Conda specifically because um, not only does Conda support multiple languages, which pip does not, right? Pip is for Python applications and packages only. Uh, not only does Conda support multiple languages, but more importantly, two Conda packages that have been installed at the same source can share their dynamic libraries, which was really important for the work that we're doing at NVIDIA because, for example, with the CUDA toolkit, uh, you don't want every package that uses the CUDA toolkit to need to have its own copy of the CUDA toolkit to install on the user's system. That's what pip requires. Uh, but with Conda, you can say, I've got a package that depends on the CUDA toolkit, and therefore it doesn't have to install its own version of the CUDA toolkit. It can share its dependency with the CUDA toolkit that has been installed at the Conda level. Um, finally, you know, we like Conda because it's a really easy to use command line tool, um, which has become de facto standard across all scientific software development. Every Conda user knows how to install packages by saying Conda install, but not every Conda user, and I know this from personal experience, knows that there are channels available that can install uh, a much bigger universe of packages than what you get from the default channel. Um, it's mentioned here, you know, the most common Conda channel is called the default channel. It's pre-installed with Anaconda, and um, no extra work is required in order to take advantage of the tools that you can get through the defaults channel. Most of you have probably seen the Conda Forge channel at this point, which is uh, growing in popularity and contains a much bigger constellation of packages than the defaults channel does, uh, in particular because the Conda Forge channel does not require that the users interact with any sort of administrative team in order to get their packages added to the defaults channel. It's something that's completely user administrated. Uh, I wanted to throw out a few other channels that are important for the CUDA team at Conda, like the NVIDIA channel, which is previously what you would use to install the CUDA toolkit. Uh, in this talk, we're talking about the progress that we've made in the CUDA toolkit on Conda Forge, which is the most popular and best known channel, and it should be easier for you to get your packages from Conda Forge going forward. Uh, if you're a Python developer, you're going to be interested in the Rapids AI channel, which is where nightly builds of QDF and QGraph and other really powerful GPU accelerated Python scientific library tools are available. And the same thing with Numba, Dask, and PyTorch. Uh, maybe you can get, well, so I think you can get Numba on the defaults channel. I think you can get all three of these on the defaults channel, but what you can't get is you can't get the nightly build of any one of these libraries on the defaults channel. There's a long turnaround time between when a particular software package is marked as stable and when it becomes available with Anaconda. And by using other channels, you can get nightly builds of things where all the latest and greatest software developments are available. Um, so this slide just goes over a lot of what I just said. Um, the defaults channel is curated by Anaconda. You have to go through a loop if you want to add code to it. You have to work with the team at Anaconda. The Conda Forge channel is uh, by far the biggest channel. It's got 20,000 packages available on it uh, last I saw it recorded. And uh, it's easy to contribute to, easy to pull from. It's very well understood at this point. And then the NVIDIA channel 
is where we did the majority of our initial work in putting CUDA toolkit and other important binaries for you guys to use. And what we're doing right now is we're moving everything into Conda Forge and making it much more flexible. So in 2018 was the first time we asked, how do we get the CUDA toolkit into Conda? And you can actually follow up on this GitHub issue and see the conversation where we worked through the initial steps and the initial limitations. And there was actually a really fundamental limitation to Conda supporting the CUDA toolkit in 2018, which is kind of the title of this GitHub issue. How do you specify the CUDA version in a Conda package? In order to solve this problem, we worked with the Anaconda team to add a, let me see if that's on the next slide, yeah. We worked with the Anaconda team to add a Dunder CUDA virtual package to the Anaconda binaries. So when you attempt to install a package that depends on CUDA toolkit with Conda, there is a virtual package. It doesn't actually have a meta.yaml attached to it. It doesn't actually have a GitHub repository for it that is able to run software on your machine to bring up your installed CUDA version. Uh, and that's, that's kind of an important detail that um, I wanted to touch on in this part of the presentation. The CUDA toolkit depends on CUDA. And as far as I know, Conda does not give us the ability to install system drivers yet. So you still have to install CUDA on your own uh, from the NVIDIA application website. And then once CUDA has been installed, Conda is now able to reflect on your installed CUDA version to determine which versions of the CUDA toolkit and everything else that you will need to install specific packages. So let's see. If you're a recipe author and you want to install, you want to create a package that takes advantage of GPU acceleration through the CUDA toolkit, the only thing that you need to know or needed to know starting in 2018 is that you needed to have a CUDA compiler specified in your package metadata. And then dependency management would take care of the rest. All of the CUDA toolkit would be installed for you. And there's a couple of examples of that on the slides for how you could spe specify CUDA as your compiler. Uh, one is to have a run export where your CUDA toolkit, it says here, this is as of today, if you're using CUDA 11.2 or earlier, this is how the CUDA toolkit is going to be installed in the top right. Uh, and then in the CUDA toolkit, that's where that double dunder or where that dunder CUDA version, the meta package, is being loaded to identify which version of CUDA you have installed. So what do we get from doing this? Starting in 2018, this is what you can get on Conda Forge and in the NVIDIA channel. Uh, it's the kitchen sink. It's uh, a whole lot of binaries that have all been compiled into a single CUDA, CUDA toolkit package. It covers a lot, um, but it doesn't cover everything. And so we're doing some work now that John has driven to make the CUDA toolkit much more versatile. And that's where Rick's going to take mm -hmm. over for me. Yeah, thanks, Hudson. So, right, you got the background on CUDA, why you want that in Conda. Mm -hmm. In 2018, we rolled out CUDA Toolkit in Conda for the first time, and so, so we're done. Everything works, right? Uh, I like this slide. This is one that John added. It's an excerpt from a podcast he listens to about the state of software today. And the, the podcast, go, podcast goes, if you listen to it, the, the one person's like, well, you know, why, why are all these things changing and breaking all the time? Why do we have to keep updating all the time and working on that? I, back in the late 90s, made a web page in HTML, and it still works today. Why can't everything be that way? <laughs> and the response was basically because everyone wants more stuff, better stuff, all the time. Uh, basically, if it's not broke, it doesn't have enough features. Uh, and that's not, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that applies here too. Hence our, our talk here on, we're updating to CUDA 12. And I mean, the, the package we released in 18 uh, did work for the most part, but it wasn't without its problems. Uh, the first one being obviously that it's, it's very large. Um, this kitchen sink approach ended up with a very big install footprint. This is a conversation on GitHub that you can look at uh, fairly recently about a Pyro install that pulled in CUDA toolkit. And I think it was even worked out where they were trying to do a CPU only install and it was still pulling in CUDA toolkit. And it was especially uh, a problem because CUDA toolkit was so large and they're like, this is such a big penalty. Why am I having this? Uh, long story short, they worked it out. This was installing, uh, had a dependency on UCX, which uh, depended on CUDA toolkit and bug in the recipe. They, everything was resolved. But the, the point here is that um, this is not cheap to install uh, from a, the perspective of uh, download and 
uh, disk size footprint. Um, kind of a, the worst of both worlds type situation is it's very large and it still doesn't even include everything. This is a, uh, this is a conversation about, uh, I think it was a recent yeah, TensorFlow uh, issue where this person was adding something and they expected because they had CUDA toolkit, it had the PTX assembler executable installed, which is something they needed. Um, this has since been resolved. But the point here is that, you know, this kitchen sink approach uh, didn't really apply to everyone. They needed a more kind of fine-grained uh, way of dialing in exactly what they needed without the big install footprint penalty. Um, which brings us here. So this is uh, some of the early work that John and others did to restructure the CUDA toolkit package. Um, Thompson touched on briefly the, the Conda channels. We have the NVIDIA channel and Conda Forge and others. Um, CUDA Toolkit was released to both NVIDIA and Conda Forge early on. The NVIDIA channel here, starting with CUDA 11.3, first started experimenting with this new uh, package hierarchy. Uh, Conda Forge hasn't caught up yet. They're still on the uh, monolithic type approach. So this issue tracks the, the work starting with CUDA 11.3 in the NVIDIA channel. Uh, and this kind of, this got all uh, flushed out well and it solved a lot of problems. This particular issue was referenced in many, many other issues as the one we're waiting for to solve all of our problems. Um, this is an image of basically the restructured CUDA, CUDA toolkit packaging. Uh, you can see uh, compared to the, the old hierarchy, which was fairly flat, series of uh, shared libraries. This is a little bit more hierarchical um, collection of not just runtimes, but also um, command line tools, you know, the, the debugger and the profiler and other things that Thompson talked about in the, in the CUDA toolkit itself are now available uh, via Conda, uh, and you can just specify just those tools if you need them. Um, so this isn't really meant to be read, it's just more of a highlighting the complexity of the things involved in this effort. Um, so now to summarize, I guess, some of the changes that are kind of more apparent to recipe maintainers. Uh, uh, the two main problems that they addressed up front was with aligning on the CUDA version and then having Conda understand the driver version installed to ensure compatibility with the uh, CUDA toolkit version you want. So those were both, uh, that functionality is still maintained, but it was improved here as well for CUDA 12. So now there's a CUDA dash version meta package instead of relying on the CUDA toolkit package itself for version alignment. So this is a lot, a much cleaner approach. And it's also uh, backwards compatible. So I can still use CUDA version, CUDA dash version meta package for aligning on CUDA 11.x uh, versions as well as the new 12. Um, it uses in the CUDA version meta package recipe, it uses a run constrained block if, if for those familiar with recipe authorship. Uh, to understand uh, the presence of either CUDA toolkit or not, and then it can align on that. It also uses the double under CUDA virtual package for validating compatibility with the system driver that you have installed in that system. So everything still works. And again, as a recipe author, if you have GPU accelerated code in your package, the main thing you really have to worry about is specifying that you require a CUDA compiler in your uh, requirements build section. So that's very nice. Um, these are some of the changes. This is a diff of a recipe update going from the 11.x version now to the 12 one. And you'll see on the right, you know, hey, there's, there's more lines here. This is more work. Why is this better? Uh, the idea here is that uh, on the left, they just had, and it's really not shown here, a uh, requirement on the CUDA compiler, which automatically pulls in CUDA, tool, CUDA toolkit. And then you kind of have to cross your fingers and hope that everything is in there that you need. On the right, uh, now I can dial in exactly I need the, the kublas dev library, I need kusparse dev, et cetera, et cetera. And you can put everything in there exactly. And then you can also, in your, uh, your run dependencies there, uh, become pin compatible version, uh, exactly the CUDA version you need using that CUDA version uh, meta package. So, so that's easy too, and a fairly standard way of doing things. Um, so that brings us to today and where we're at with all this work. Um, so we have the CUDA toolkit, CUDA 12 packages. Um, mostly, I think they're built on Conda Forge. This issue tracks all of the you know, individual subcomponents that I showed you on that eye chart earlier. Um, and I don't, I don't have the exact status, but I think they're mostly checked off, which is 
which is great. But this being uh, Conda Forge, of course, where one of the nice things about Conda Forge is it kind of guarantees the package in Conda Forge has been built against all of its build dependencies that also exist in Conda Forge. So everything's kind of curated and nicely guaranteed for good interop. Uh, because of that, all of the packages, yeah, all of the packages that uh, depend on CUDA Toolkit are also in the process of being rebuilt for the CUDA 12 version that is now being added to Conda Forge. So this issue uh, tracks all that, but actually this one is a, a great one. I recommend you reading this if you want much more uh, informative, detailed background than, than what we're giving here today. This is written up by John, and he goes into uh, detail about what's happening. Mm -hmm. But this uh, is, is there up on, the, the, uh, on GitHub for the uh, Conda Forge. Oh yeah, the, the Conda Forge GitHub. And it also, I think, tracks, well, yeah, this is what I was looking for. This one tracks the migration status of all those packages in Conda Forge. Um, I think as of today, this is at least two more are done in, in, the, in the big migration, but it's non-trivial. Um, but the good thing is once uh, everything's up, the next steps will be even easier. So close out CUDA 12 migration, um, add new docs, and then uh, start working on 12.1. That's, that's just a minor release though. It's gonna take advantage of all this new structure. It'll be much easier to do moving forward. Um, of course, as with all next steps, collect user feedback and evaluate what to do from there and the, and the cycle continues. Um, and with that, I, we will try to answer your questions as best as possible, but that that's, uh, covers it. Thank you so much. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. I think John is also available on the on Slack here for questions. He's he's attending virtually right now. Hey, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so I haven't really thought too much about this question, but uh, I'm, I'm someone who ends up uh, containerizing a lot of my physics analysis software to have it be able to be globally distributed. And normally when we're using uh, code that needs access to GPUs, we usually just reach for the NVIDIA base images. Uh, but sometimes we have these uh, very uh, overly large custom Docker images that we're uh, building for the experiments and then to try and originally build that on top of the NVIDIA images might not always be as easy. Is it, uh, is it possible in your mind that we would be able to basically just use uh, these CUDA distributed, or these, sorry, Conda distributed CUDA uh, libraries to be able to basically now just put those on, on top at the very end? I think so. Um, okay. We actually have a fair number of Docker images that consist of, uh, you know, using the NVIDIA base image, you know, which includes the uh, the relevant parts that sit on sit underneath any of the CUDA, CUDA toolkit parts uh, already, and then we will actually in that image uh, install a Conda environment, which pulls from Conda Forge or and NVIDIA, and just work in there. Um, we use that for development as well as. Uh, I think we have some runtime images that do the same thing with just fewer of the dev libraries and stuff. But um, I know it feels a little counterintuitive to have Docker and then the advantages of Conda on top of that inside Docker. It seems like, eh, I just need one of those, don't I? But uh, this actually works fairly well. It's pretty, pretty easy to do. Thank you, any more questions? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm in the molecular simulations community and I know we're very active on your issue trackers, but I wanna say a huge thank you for all the work you've done to make CUDA Toolkit available on Conda. Um, oh yeah, I, I will pass that to John. I, he, he is doing so much more than Thompson and I are doing, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so uh, my question, I wanted to clarify one thing from the talk, because um, yeah, right now we're, we're pulling down the several hundred megabyte packages and so if I understand correctly, in the new CUDA Toolkit 12 and higher packages, you're gonna have these divided into sort of the individual libraries. So we're only gonna pull down exactly the components that we need. Right. Um, is that gonna be backported to the 11 series as well? I don't think it is, 
but I also don't want to speak out of turn. My, my thought was, I don't think it will be. Um, okay. Or no, I'm oh. sorry, the, sorry, sorry. The in, yeah, I forgot about the NVIDIA channel. So the NVIDIA channel, starting with CUDA 11.3, has that new hierarchy already. ContaForge, if you're stuck, if you're just only using ContaForge, I don't know if they're gonna have 11 dot CUDA versions backported to the new structure. So if 11.3 is good enough for you, yes. If you need to go even further back than 11.3, it's probably not. And then the whole point of this moving forward too is then the NVIDIA channel and the ContaForge channel will be aligned again in structures starting with 12 and beyond. Um, oh, that's a great change. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Yes, please. So Daniel on Slack uh, says he's on HPC system that provides locally distributed CUDA toolkit, even multiple versions of it and, and with modules. And he's wondering, if, like, the move to Conda would, would, install, would require an install in every Conda environment, the whole thing. He's wondering if there can be, like, a dummy package that points to a local um, install because, you know, as, as your number of environment grows, yeah. You, you're sort of, it's a lose, and on HPC environments, I can really feel that, yeah. Yeah, that's probably more of a, of a conda question, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, that's I, my take on it. And I know that there's this notion of a sorry, base. Sorry, you guys are supposed to get oh, close to my Sorry, sorry, I apologize. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's probably more of a conda question, um, and I think there's this notion of a base environment that you can install to, which the other environments can leverage but I'm probably not the best person to answer that. Well, I wanted to chime in also that if you've got multiple versions of the CUDA toolkit targeting different versions of CUDA, then the binary image for each of those toolkits is going to be pretty disjoint, and there's not gonna be a lot of reusability from version to version, uh, and I think that odds are you're, uh, unless Conda has uh, implemented better library sharing that we don't know about, I think you're going to be stuck with uh, many images. We have time for one more question. Yes. Um, do you guys um, work with like the Cocos developers or people who like want to use CUDA but also might want to run their stuff on AMD hardware, for example, um, to, to make, s no. <laughs> I, I don't personally, uh, no, I don't. That might be a good question for the Slack channel, though. John's there to field that one. All right, uh, let's thank the speakers again. We have a 10-minute break now.